Hello everybody, welcome back. Hope you're doing well. Uh, today we're doing another Strengths Materials video. This one's going to be super easy. We're dealing with torque loaded assemblies with non-circular shafts. We've already talked about a bunch of different ways to analyze shafts that are of a circular shape, whether they're hollow, whether they're composite, whether the assembly's uh, indeterminately torque loaded. Uh, we've covered a bunch of different videos, so if you want an intro to that, you can click the top here. But we're going to talk about the main differences of why we need to analyze uh, non-circular shapes a little bit differently. Um, and it comes down to some simple theory. And pretty much we can start by talking about what was the theory for the circular shaft. So pretty much the theory for the circular shaft is when we were looking at the cross section, we had a axis symmetric section. And what that pretty much meant was that we had a uniform shear stress development. And what that also meant was that if we looked at the longitudinal axis, we would have zero stress developed at the center, which is where that longitudinal axis was. And as we went out to the furthest point on our exterior surface, we would develop a max shearing stress. And because of the uniform diameter, that max shearing stress would occur throughout that entire uh, surface point. Also, because of that uniform section, we would notice that as you twist a circular shaft, imagine you had a, a cylindrical pencil, for example, if you twisted it, you would notice that the circular shape would not be lost. You wouldn't have any deformation or bulging. That's kind of the main difference when you're analyzing these types of uh, different shapes here, such as the square triangle and ellipse. We're gonna notice that we're gonna have a bulge or a warp develop as we apply uh, a torque to the section simply because the axis is no or the um, symmetry of the section is no longer axis symmetrical what that also meant is that the uniform stress distribution that we had previously is no longer uniform anymore with respect to given reference points okay now the an analysis of these sections is a little bit more complex if you were to take like an arbitrary point uh, from these sections. And for that reason, we have developed equations for specific sections, specific solid non-circular sections to determine the max shearing stress and the angle of twist with respect to those cross-sectional properties. And the max shearing stresses will actually develop at these points indicated on the sections here, here, and here uh, for the ellipse, the triangle, and the square. That's pretty much all you need to know. But for those of you who are a little bit, you know, more locked into this video, you'll notice that the distance between the longitudinal axis and these points of reference are actually the shortest distance away from the longitudinal axis, which is different from what we talked about before with the circular section, because we had the longest distance from the longitudinal axis creating the max shearing stress. So why is that the case now? Well, to keep things simple, if you imagined, I have it over here actually, if you imagined that we tried to fit a circular shaft right uh, to fit inside of this square section, we're gonna notice that there's only a certain amount of area that this circular shaft is going to cover. And you'll notice that where these points align the square shaft, that's actually where those max shearing stresses are developed. Now, without getting into the nitty gritty of the theory, this pretty much allows us to apply our previously recalled concepts that the distance from the furthest point of the shaft, the circular shaft, to the longitudinal axis will still develop the max shearing stress. However, these new uh, extruded sections beyond this boundary are now creating a different formula for analysis. Okay, that's pretty much all you need to know for the theory. Now we can hop into the problem and see what's going on. Alrighty, so now that we have all the theory covered, we can finally hop into the problem. The problem goes as follows. We have the aluminum strut, uh, which is fixed between two walls A and B, right here and right here. And it's asking us if it has a two inch by two inch square cross section and is subject to a torque of 80 pounds per feet at C, determine the reactions at the fixed supports and also, what is the angle of twist at C? First thing that should jump out at us is that we have an indeterminate torque loaded assembly 
meaning that we have two fixed ends where we have reactions produced TA and TB, which are acting to resist the externally applied torque. And from our understanding of equilibrium, we know that to bring the system to zero, we have to set up our equilibrium equations, or you could think of it as a compatibility equation as well, where you have TA being positive based on our convention, plus TB minus 80 will bring the entire system to zero. We also need to recall uh, some information about indeterminately torque loaded assemblies where, let's write recall right here. We know that because of these fixed ends at B and at A, the angle of twist created at A is going to be equal to the angle of, uh, angle of twist created at B, and they're both going to be equal to zero because they're super locked in place. And if you take an infinitesimally small point right at those fixed ends, the angle of twist will equal zero. So writing that down, if we write down theta A is equal to theta B is equal to zero, then we can relate this understanding to the angle of twist formulas which are going to be slightly changed because of what we have written for square cross sections. The formula is going to be slightly different. Now, the last thing we need to do is figure out a formula that's going to work in order to solve for one of these variables, TA or TB, which is why I've drawn this uh, torque graph here. So if you start from left to right, we're going to notice that the torque at A to C it's going to be equal to TA. Whatever reaction is being produced here is going to have to bring it back down in order to uh, be equal to zero. And then similarly, as we have that 80 pound per foot uh, opposite torque, we're going to have some torque being externally developed here. And then we have the TB bringing our system back to zero. So what is the equivalent torque at this location? It would be equal to TA. If we're working from left to right, we go TA, TA, TA. Big jump with 80, which is in the negative convention. And now we have something we can work with. Now we know, based on our recall over here, that the angle of twist at A with respect to B is going to equal zero. Therefore, if we're taking the cumulative rule of the angle of twist formula, we're going to have the angle of twist between A and C plus the angle of twist between C and B. We're going to be using these formulas to solve it. So first things first, we're going to start with AC. So we have 7.1. We're going to have the torque TA. times the length, which is two feet. And we have A4, which is simply the dimension of the cross section, times G, which is our shearing modulus given in the problem. And we're gonna be adding the effect of CB as well, which is also 7.1. But the torque is slightly different now because we have TA minus 80 along that length of three feet and a four g on the bottom once again if you broke down the components uh, of this formula we're going to have some constants that are coming through we have ta here if you neglect these for now since they're going to cancel out at the end of the problem either way you can distribute the 7.1 and the 3 into this problem where you have a 21.3 here, TA, then you have minus 1704. And then solving for TA from this problem, you're going to be left with a nice number of 48 pounds per feet. All right, just had to clean up the problem. With that 48 pounds per feet, we recall our equilibrium equation and we can plug it in where we have 48 plus TB minus 80 
And solving for that, you're going to have TB, which is equal to 32 pounds per feet. And those are your answers for both of the reactions. Now, the last thing you need to do is solve for theta C. And that's going to be as follows. You're using the same formula and you can solve for theta C by going from C with respect to A. And we have 7.1 times the torque. And we've already solved for that, which is 48 pounds per feet. And our cross section is given to us in inches. So we're going to have to convert this. And the way to do so is we say we have 12 inches per foot. And similarly, we have that length as well, which is two feet. And once again, converting it 12 inches per foot. All over our geometric properties, which is going to be two times the power of four. And then the shearing modulus, which is given to us in KSI. So 3.8 times 10 to the three. So we're going to take 3.8 times 10 to the six to get this in terms of pounds per inch squared. All of these terms are going to cancel out and you will be left with an angle of twist at, the, at C equal to 0 0.0161 radians. And that's the problem. Super simple, super easy. Uh, it's just recalling you know, concepts from the past and applying these new equations to it. Uh, so thanks for watching.